Hey, well, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Good. It's good to see you all here. Welcome to Foundations Church. My name is Scott. I'm the worship director around here. If we haven't met, I'd love to meet you. Come shake my hand on the way out. And if you're new here, welcome, special welcome to you. You're going to find out really quick that we are Jesus people around here. We believe that Jesus is the hope for humanity. He's the answer. He's the solution. And so we put all our eggs in that basket. We believe that um, Jesus came to save uh, to save us. And so we exist as a church to, to bring the extraordinary life of Jesus to a lost and broken world. And we're honored that you would choose to spend part of your weekend with us. I always like to take a second, too, to look into the camera, to welcome everybody joining us by way of the internet, wherever you're watching from, hopefully the warmth of your home. It's freezing out here today, but we're glad that you've tuned in to be with us. Uh, if you're ever in our area, stop by, say hi. We'd love to meet you. Church, would you help me welcome our online family this morning? Glad that you're with us. <clears throat> And if you didn't know, we are only 10 days away from Christmas. Can you believe that? It's crazy. If you didn't know, you're probably in more trouble than you realize, too. But 10 days till Christmas, and we love to call this time of year the most wonderful time of year, right? But the statistics would prove that to be not true. I'm going to start with a couple of discouraging statistics to start the day. 88% of people feel stressed during the holidays. Anybody there today? Anyone? Thank you. Me, too. Appreciate your honesty. There's so much stress at this time of year. The top three topics of conversation to be avoided with family are politics, right? This is going to be especially fun this next year too, right? Personal matters, anything personal, like, hey, how you doing? None of your business. Well, I'm your mom. I don't care. Like, we can't, can't talk about anything personal. It's just ridiculous. And religion, of course. So the things that you can't talk about are anything that matters at all. So really, our conversations boil down to like, well, uh, it's cold out there, and uh, some other times it's hot, so it's in the middle maybe sometimes too, I guess. I don't know. Uncle Jim, it was great to see you. Merry Christmas. We'll see you around next year, later. Like the lamest conversations in the world, because we can't talk about anything important. How about this one? The average couple has seven arguments during the holidays. Maybe some of you are saying, I wish we could get down to that number. Down to seven would be amazing. <laughs> we argue about a lot of things. The top five holiday arguments include this. Where to go, money, family, cleaning up. Anybody argue about these things? I know we do. And cooking, of course. I love this one. 85% of people overeat during the holidays. The thing I love about this is it shows that 15% of people are liars. That's what that says. Everybody overeats during the holidays. Come on, that's too tempting. And last but most certainly not least, 42% of people unbutton their pants after a holiday meal. 42%. And the other 58% don't even have to unbutton it. The button just pops off from all the excessive pressure. Nothing like a whole list of discouraging statistics to start your day off, right? Merry Christmas, everybody. Welcome to church. We are glad that you're here. And if you've turned on your TV any time in the last year, you know that our world is obsessed with bad news. It took me about five seconds to find these statistics. We are a people that are obsessed with bad news. And media outlets like CNN and Fox, they capitalize on this and they attract and they maintain millions of viewers on a daily basis with round-the-clock doses of bad news. And if your life is anything like mine, you've got no more room for bad news. It's probably why you came this weekend. Is anybody else in need of some good news this weekend? Yeah, me too. And it's why we come around this story every single week. This is good news that is caused for great joy for all people. The truth is, you know this, you feel this, Christmas is a really dark time for many of us. This time of year is a constant and an excruciating reminder of the loved ones that we've lost. Or maybe Christmas is just a magnifying glass for your loneliness. Or maybe it's an ongoing in-your-face commercial reminding you of the fact that you don't have enough money to pay your bills, let alone buy presents. Maybe Christmas is the most stressful time of the year because it forces you to spend time with family members that feel like enemies and there's bitterness and there's resentment and brokenness and it feels too messy to even start to work towards resolution or reconciliation. Maybe this Christmas marks another year of bad news regarding your health. 
The diagnosis is way worse than you expected, and your future is shaky, and your future is dark. If that's you this Christmas, if this year, and especially this season, is just marked by bad news, you need to know that there is good news. The good news for you is that you are not alone and you are not unseen in your struggle and in your darkness. God might feel a million miles away, but he is closer than he has ever been. Because the truth is, the 2,000 years ago, a people living in darkness saw a great light. And that light, Jesus Christ, shined into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So if your world is dark and cold and lonely this Christmas, there is good news for you. The light, Jesus, has come. And this Christmas, Jesus, the light of the world, has the power to transform you in a way that exceeds your wildest imagination. We're going to talk about that today. Really glad that you're here. Would you stand with me? We're going to start our time in John's Gospel, chapter 8. John, chapter 8, and verse 12. John says this. He says, when Jesus spoke again to the people... He said, you read the yellow with me, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There's good news this Christmas. The light has come. Let's pray together. God, we take a moment this morning to just say thank you for who you are, for what you've done. For the reality that when we were living in darkness and we were running from you, that you came, you chased after us when we didn't want anything to do with you and you shined your light into our dark world. So this morning, God, our world feels cold and dark and lonely and broken and we need you. And so we ask that you would light up our life like only you can do. Speak to us now. We need you. We seek you. And we thank you for the promise that when we seek you, we find you. We love you, and we thank you for loving us first. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. And as you're getting seated, I want to start today with a survey. How many of you put Christmas lights up on your house this year? Anybody? Yes. Thank you. A collective thank you to all of you. You make our world better at this time of year. Something to look forward to. We have a bright light in the darkness. What about anybody you were planning on putting up Christmas lights, but then you convinced yourself out of it because of the snow or the weather? Anybody brave enough to raise? Yes. Thank you. Honesty. Yeah, it was terrible. That snow. What about anybody that would be bold enough to say, I have never hung a Christmas light in my life. I never will. I see you. Thank you for your honesty. You're what we call smart people. Yeah, that's what you are. You're smart. Because the truth is, as much as I love to look at Christmas lights, I go through all of this work, and you know who gets the most enjoyment out of my Christmas lights? My neighbors. Exactly. I do all this hard work, and I'm really condemning myself because... We're a Christmas light family. We hang them every year, but, but just think about it for a second. The decision to hang Christmas lights is maybe one of the dumbest decisions I make every year. I go through all the effort of going down to the basement and untangling all these lights from dusty boxes and wrangling up extension cords and extension ladders and then risking my life to go up on my roof and hang those terrible little plastic clips all along my gutter. I do all of this. And this year was worse than any other because I had to risk my life after that Thanksgiving snowpocalypse. I get up on our roof and there is snow melting down our rooftop. I risked my life truly this year. And I quickly noticed as soon as I got up on my roof that one of our neighbors come out to shovel his sidewalk. And he really just came to watch me, just staring at me, (laughs) waiting for an accident to happen, 911 on speed dial. It reminded me of like a NASCAR fan. Like he's not really hoping that an accident happens, but you better believe he's not going to miss it if it does. (laughs) Just staring at me the whole time, not even getting anything done. But I didn't die. I'm still alive. So praise God for that. And our lights are up and they look pretty good. But it's amazing after all of the work to put them up and they look great. Don't get me wrong. But I go through all of this hassle only to increase my electricity bill exclusively for the enjoyment of my neighbor. This is craziness, but I do it every year. You know what you call that? Dumb. That's what you call that. And I do it again, so I must be an idiot. We just can't help ourselves. We love Christmas lights. And we only get to see them for about five seconds each day as we pull into our garage, but totally worth it, right? It's not. I'll just tell you that right now. And as silly as Christmas lights are, it's amazing what 
just a little bit of light will do in darkness. See, Christmas lights in the daytime are really useless, right? Nobody plugs in their Christmas lights first thing in the morning and then lets them run all day because no one would notice that they were even shining. Christmas lights, along with really any light, can only display the full extent of their brightness in the dark. See, because you've heard this before, but darkness is not actually a thing. It's an absence of a thing. Darkness is the absence of light. That's how you define it. So you can't actually define darkness apart from the light. And darkness comes in all shapes and sizes, right? Divorce, depression, miscarriage, cancer, addiction, mourning, unemployment, bankruptcy. Darkness is a reality we all live with. Darkness is an equal opportunity employer. Nobody gets a pass. We all face it. Peter said it this way. Peter said, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. He says, this is not strange. Darkness is not out of the order. It's inevitable. I heard one preacher say at any point in life, you're either coming out of darkness, you're right in the middle of it or you're about to head into it. There's a really encouraging word of truth to keep you going for this week. You're welcome for that one. Don't you wish you could just schedule your darkness sometimes? Like, hey God, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, my bills are paid, my health is all right. I caught up on my sleep. Go ahead, send some darkness my way, I can take it, I'll be good. But that's not how it works, right? No, usually darkness hits us at the most inconvenient times and out of nowhere. So what do you do when darkness surrounds you? What do you do when you feel blind and disoriented in life? What do you do when you've lost the light at the end of your tunnel? Jesus tells us. He says, remember me. He says, when life is dark, when you've lost control, you've lost your way, you've lost your hope, maybe you've lost your will to live this Christmas. When you've lost your ability to see the way forward, remember, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's amazing just a little light can do in a dark situation. My wife Kayla and I have three kids, one of which is a three-year-old. And if you've ever parented a three-year-old before, you know that if their room is dark at night, they will not sleep and they will not let you sleep either. So every single night we put Zoe to bed and we try to put her down in darkness, but she won't sleep. She needs that little night light and then she's fine. Just this tiny little night light makes all of the difference in the world. How many were afraid of the dark as a kid? Yes, thank you, honestly. What about you say, forget that, I'm an adult and I'm still afraid of the dark, anyone? Yes, thank you, (laughs) appreciate that honestly. It's crazy, just a little bit of light, and it makes all the fear go away. The truth is, all it takes is just a tiny little light to dispel the power of darkness. And the good news for you today is that Jesus is not just a tiny little light. He's not just a little night light. No, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The light of the world. You've probably heard that phrase before, and I have too, but I have to be honest, I haven't thought a lot about that phrase before this week. I've always just kind of thought it was a cool name to call God, the light of the world. It sounds really great, but, but I think when Jesus spoke these words to the people living in the Middle East in the first century, I think their minds immediately went to one very specific thing. See, Jesus called himself the light of the world long before electricity had been invented, And so firelight would help dispel darkness at nighttime. But there was really only one true source of light for the whole world. You ready for the world's easiest riddle? What is the one true source of light for the whole world? Anyone? The sun, yes. You're very smart people at this 1130 service. The sun. It's the only source of light for the whole world. The sun was the best concept people had for the source of light for the world. I'm going to go against all the advice your mom ever gave you growing up and encourage you to look directly into the sun right now. 
feel like such a rebel in church. It's amazing. But it's an incredible picture, right? This massive ball of fire, the center of our universe, the source of energy and the source of life. See, without the sun, there would be no life on earth. Here are a few fun facts about the sun. Did you know this? The sun makes up 99.8% of the mass of the entire solar system. 99.8%. Anyone know the sun's core temperature? Anyone? Last service, somebody said, hot. (laughs) Appreciate that. It's 27 million degrees Fahrenheit, which makes the surface temperature of 10,000 degrees feel lukewarm. The sun is the closest star to Earth at 93 million miles away. And the sun's gravity holds the entire solar system together, keeping everything from the biggest planets to the tiniest particles of debris in orbit around it. The sun's radius, that's the distance from the center to the circumference, is 432,000 miles. To give you a little context, if the sun was the size of a front door, the Earth would be about the size of a nickel. You could fit 1.3 million Earths inside of the sun. The sun is an absolute marvel of creation. It is the light of the world. So I don't think it's any accident that Jesus called himself the light of the world. Because the sun is the most powerful thing we can see. So Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I am the source. I am your everything. Without me, you have no life. You have only darkness. And that is the beauty of the Christmas story. Jesus connects the dots in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 16. He reminds the people of the words written about him 700 years before he was born by a prophet named Isaiah. Isaiah says this, that the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Zechariah says it this way in the book of Luke chapter 1 in verse 78. He says the rising sun. Jesus was not the first to call himself the light of the world. Zechariah says the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness. Jesus said before me darkness reigned. But Merry Christmas, joy to the world, the light has come. See, this darkness was not just the reality of the people who lived before Jesus came. This is the reality of all of us before Jesus. Paul explains it this way in chapter 5 of a letter written to the people living in a city called Ephesus. He says this in verse 8, for once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. And so live as people of light, for the light makes everything visible. And this is why it is said, Awake, O sleeper, rise up from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See, the truth is, at one point in our lives, we were all dead and in darkness. There is no such thing as a person born good. We are all full of darkness from birth. No matter how cute your baby might be, I've got one too, and she is absolutely adorable. Look at this picture. (laughs) Jubilee Grace. The best, absolutely the cutest, but don't let her cuteness trick you. She's full of wickedness and despair. She's full of just this vile filth that just comes out. And every three hours, I get a reminder of that filth by way of a diaper. So praise God for the diaper, Jeannie. But it is still so stinky. You know this if you have a baby, that no one is born in light. We're born crying and screaming and needy. We're born in darkness. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See, God's standard is perfection. And the truth is, we have all missed it. No matter how hard we try, no matter how good we look, no matter how strong we feel, we have all sinned, we have all been born in darkness, and we have no way out on our own. That is the bad news. And that is why we call this story the good news. See, because if we were born in light, we'd have no concept of darkness and we'd have no need for light. But we all have a need for light. We all have a need for a savior. 
And the good news for you today is that he is not far away. He is not hiding. He is not dead. He is not distant. In fact, he's been waiting since the day you were born for you just to turn to him. And that's all it takes is just a turn to him. A turn from darkness to light. A turn from, from sin and worthlessness to a life of, of worth. From wandering to purpose. That's all it takes is a turn. So Paul says, all have sinned and fall short, yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. I wonder, is there anybody in this room today grateful for the grace of God in their lives? Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's worth celebrating too. God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. And he did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. That is the beauty of what Jesus offers you this Christmas season. All you need to do is ask for the light, believe in the light, and you will receive the light. And maybe you're sitting there today and you say, yeah, 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 that's, that's great. Forgiveness, eternal life, that's awesome. I get it. And you'd be right. It is awesome. But maybe you've received that forgiveness and you wonder, is that it? Did Jesus simply come to offer me hope for the future, hope for someday? And the answer is no. No, see, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But Jesus did not come just so that we could sit around and stare at him for our whole lives, hoping for the future. I think too many Christians live this way, just upward focused, thinking only about the future. I'm just looking at the light, and we bump into people around us, the mission field that God has called us to, and we're just bumping into people. Sorry, I'm just focused on the light. Don't mind me. And people are like, what light are you talking about? That's too busy. Too busy to tell you about the light. I'm just I'm staring at it, so watch out. Here I come. I don't think that's how God intended us to live. See, my point today is this, that Jesus did not come just so we could see the light and keep our eyes focused up there. No, he came so that we could be the light. Jesus didn't come. Yes, thank you. Appreciate that, Mom. That's very encouraging. <laughs> Jesus didn't come just so that we could see the light. He came so we could be the light. Yes. See, in John chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, and he is. But then in Matthew chapter 5, in his most famous sermon, he flips the script. Jesus says this. He says, you, you, are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And you say, wait, 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 Jesus, hold on. I, I, I thought you said you were the light of the world. He would say, I did, yeah. But then how could we be the light of the world too? I, I don't get it. I think Jesus would say, look, I didn't come to stay. I came to give, to give my life and then to give you the Holy Spirit and then to give the world my light through you. He says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus says to you today, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world, which is absolutely epic, right? But if you're anything like me, it's, it's overwhelming and it's, it's too heavy a pressure to live under. And I think if that's you today, if you have pressure in your relationship with God, I think Jesus would say to you today, relax. Relax. You are the light of the world. There is no question about that. But unlike me, unlike Jesus, we are not the source for the light. We are just reflectors. We are just mirrors of the light. See, when it comes to following Jesus, there will always exist a pressure in my relationship with God as long as I am trying to be something or to do something which he never intended me to do or to be. He is the source. We are his mirror. It's kind of like this. This is a searchlight. And according to the, the world's foremost leading source for truth, wikipedia.com, a searchlight is an apparatus that combines an extremely bright source, that is Jesus, with a mirrored reflector, that's us. It combines those things to project a powerful beam of light in a particular direction, and it's usually constructed so that it can be swiveled about. See, when we're living life as God designed us to, 
in relationship with him, we function like a searchlight. He is the source. We are his reflector. And we work together to swivel about and shine a powerful beam of light to seek and to save that which is lost. It's good. But how do we do this? Do we just take this light and just point it at people like, I got you. I got you in your darkness. Come on, look at the light. Don't you see it? Isn't it awesome? No, that's what you call blinding people with the light. God has not called us to blind the world with the light. No, he has called us to give the light to the world as a gift. You know how you're shining light rightly? It's if it's received like a gift. See, if you've ever seen somebody tell people about Jesus in a way that was forceful or aggressive or demeaning, you know what it looks like to blind people with the light. Because the truth is, the truth is that God shined his light into our darkness, not as a way to shame us, not as a way to say, I hate you, just the opposite. No, God does not hate you. Hear it loud and clear. God loves you. He loves you so much, he sent his own son to die for you. And so the reason he shines his light into our darkness is not for condemnation's sake. No, it's because he's showing us there is a better way to live. The reason God ever commanded us to do anything was not so that we could just stay inside of his little lines. No, 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 no. God says, look, I know the end from the beginning, and so I know what's best for you. I want an abundant life for you. And so if you want to know what that looks like, here it is. Look, I want what's best for you. I have your best in mind. Here's what it looks like. Here is the light. And so we aim to live out this abundant light and shine brightly, and, and we mess up, right? If you've messed up your life today or if you're living in the middle of a mess right now, the message God has for you is not go fix it on your own, clean that up, and then come find me, and maybe, just maybe, I'll help you. No, no, no. Jesus says to you today, I saw your mess from the beginning of time, and I know you're crippled under the weight of your shame today, but remember, I am still with you. You might be running from me, but you cannot outrun me because I am with you, surely until the end of the age, everywhere you go. So church, in your, in your mess, don't forget your mission. Because the truth is, Jesus did not just save us from something. Jesus saved us for something. He has a purpose for your life. He has shined his light on you so that you could be the light to the watching world around you. He put you in your family and in your office space and in your classroom and in your gym and in your grocery store so that you could shine your light to the dark world around you. Jesus wants to shine his light through you. And again, if you're like me, this is overwhelming because most of the time, this is what life feels like. It feels dark and cold and lonely and depressing. And everywhere I look, I just see division and brokenness, wrong being called right and right being called wrong and anger and heartbreak and abuse. And it's overwhelming. It's terrifying, really. And if I'm honest, most of the time, I feel like this. Yeah, I, I have a light, but it doesn't do much good. Yeah, I have a light, but really all I can do is just shine one step in front of me. It's not very big. Yeah, I've got a light, but you don't really notice it. I mean, if you're looking for it, you could see it maybe, but not really bright, not really made for much. Can't do much. Sure can't take, take care of all this darkness. And even though this is how I feel, the reality is this. See, Jesus says to you today, you are brighter than you realize. And you have power above and beyond what you can even understand. And I have called you to partner with me in searching out and in saving that which was lost to shine my light on them. And when you're working the way that I've intended you to work, the pressure is off. Because when people see you, they see me. 
So who in your life needs that light? Who needs you to show them what Jesus thinks of them? Church, you haven't just been given this light to hold on to and hoard and just wait until Jesus comes back for us. No, no, no. You've got the light to give the light. You've got the light to give the light. So this week, I don't know what it looks for you. Maybe it looks like a conversation that you've been avoiding. Maybe it looks like an apology that you need to give. I don't know what it means, but I would just encourage you this week to, to ask God. Just say, Jesus, how can I shine my light this week? Give me wisdom to know what that might look like. And then give me courage to go and step in and to do it. I think one of the easiest ways to shine a light this week would be to just take one of these cards. Just take one of these cards, and you can take as many as you want, but take at least one and ask God to give you an opportunity to invite somebody to Christmas Eve services with a simple invitation. Four words is all you need. Just tell them, come sit with me. Come sit with me for Christmas Eve services. You don't have to explain all the Bible or theology. Just tell them, hey, look, this place has really changed my life. It's helped me out a lot. I bet it could be helpful for you too. It's worth checking out. So come sit with me. I'll be at this service on this day at this time. Here's my phone number. Come sit with me. See, this time of year, people are more open than any other time of year to come to church. So I'd encourage you to just make a simple invite for one person to come. Invite them to come and taste and see that God is good. And the pressure's off you. It always has been. Look, God will show up. You don't have to show up. You just have to be faithful. Just invite somebody. Say, look, come and see. God is good. And trust that he's going to show up and show them that he's good. He always does. The truth is, somebody did this for you, right? And aren't you so glad that they did? Aren't you so glad that they did? And isn't that person that you're thinking of inviting worth the risk that somebody took on you? Aren't they worth it? To be a little uncomfortable for a minute, maybe to get a no back, maybe a dirty look. They're worth the risk because somebody risked for you. And so in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was. But we turned our own way and we walked in darkness. And for thousands of years, people lived in darkness. Until one day, the light came into the world. We read that Jesus came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. They killed him. And darkness reigned again. For three days. For three days, darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then, on the third day, the light shined again. Be reminded today, no matter how dark your situation, and it may be dark, I have been there. As a freshman in college, I let go of everything that gave my life stability. I let go of my family, my home. I let go of my four-year dating relationship with my now wife. I let go of all my friends from high school. I let go of my church community. I let go of my education and my career plans. I let go of so much that I felt like I no longer had anything to hold on to. And I walked around the campus of Colorado State University in darkness and hopelessness, wondering if I had any purpose left at all. But the light was there. And he's there for you today too. Right in the middle of your darkness, remember Jesus, the light of the world is with you. And he has promised to never leave you and never forsake you. So no matter how dark your life might feel today, remember, church, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world and your light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. 
See, the darkness can test it. The darkness can try and cover it up. The darkness can trick you into believing that you lost it. It can make you think that you never even saw the light in the first place. But there is one thing the darkness can never do. Your light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God is there. So may we go and be the light this week. Would you stand with me as we close our time today in prayer? So God, we say thank you this morning that you are the light of the world. And that you didn't leave us in darkness. You could have. You didn't need us. We need you. And so you came for us. You met our need as you always do. We say thank you for sending your son Jesus to to shine brightly into our darkness. For some of us today, maybe we have never turned into that light before. And all it takes is to turn. All it takes is a simple prayer to say, look, I've been living in darkness and I choose the light today. I turn from my darkness and I turn to your light, Jesus. And in an instant, you can be forgiven, set free and redeemed. You can carry the light of the world both now and forevermore. All it takes is a prayer of faith to say, Jesus, I believe that you paid the penalty for my sin on that cross and you rose in victory from the grave on that third day. And so I no longer have to live in darkness. I choose to live inside of your light. And if you make that decision right now, you can do it right there where you're standing. I'd encourage you to come and pray with somebody after the service. But for many of us, we have made that decision. We've said yes, but our lives still feel dark, still feel hopeless, feel desperate, cold, and lonely. So Jesus, remind us this week that we have not lost the light, that you're with us and that you've purposed us to shine that light that we've been given, the light of the world to the dark and watching world around us. Would you ignite a fire on the inside of us so that we might be purposed? Give us eyes to see and ears to hear who it is you might have us light up this Christmas season. Start a fire in our soul, Jesus. We pray in your mighty name. Amen.